Hello, welcome to Smash Hit Sports, and we have our national champions. Congratulations to the Yukon Huskies going back to back in what is probably the most impressive tournament run I have ever seen. And then South Carolina women's team knocking off Caitlin Clark and pulling off a perfect undefeated season. Don Staley gets her third national title. Um, Nick, a hell of a weekend. The these games were were outstanding, but let's start with the men's final four and, and national title. The final four kind of stunk. It, it kind of yeah. stunk. You know, I'll tell you this, and, and this is um, you know, I, I was teetering on whether or not I should make this public, um, because I'm such an adv- advocate for you you can't miss uh March Madness game. Like Maybe, yeah, you can miss the 116, but Final Four, like, under no circumstances are you just doing something else. But my uh, cousin was getting married, and the ceremony was during the first game, and the reception was during pretty much the whole rest of, um, you know, the entire Final Four. So I was checking scores, but I couldn't watch. I actually watched zero seconds, um, and I was really upset for a while. Then my phone died. But then I saw that both games weren't really that close. And I thought to myself, like, that's God looking out for me. You know, like that's like he knew I was in a pickle and he he delivered because I didn't miss anything. Thank God. Yep. And for those of you who listened to the vacation episode, um, we gave our final four preview. And I I thought I don't know how you felt after that episode, but I didn't feel great about the episode because I was like, well, we both think UConn's going to win. We both think Purdue's going to win. And then it's going to be UConn and Purdue. And it's probably going to be UConn. And I know that you picked NC State, but like... Yeah, I picked it out that, of just to be different, though, yeah. Yeah, and I'm going to be honest. Like, I didn't feel great about the podcast. I was like, well, there wasn't a whole lot of juice in that. And turns out it's just because there wasn't a whole lot of juice in those games. It, it was... Yeah. It, it kind of went exactly how we thought it would. Alabama shot 48% from three. And did not give UConn – like, UConn didn't even look phased. They they were they shooting got, – They shot 75% from three in the first half, and they were down four. Yeah. That's that, like, it, that's it was, Alabama, that's what they do. If they're making their threes, you're losing to them. And yes. they were making their threes more so than normal, and they were still down. That's, yeah. that, that's what it was. Mark over. Sears was looking like prime Steph Curry. Like, it, it was unbelievable. He couldn't miss. And, and yeah, UConn – just walk through uh, like Tristan Newton didn't play an outstanding game. Like there, there were, there were games in this tournament where like UConn's would have an all American who just didn't kind of didn't play well, whether it was Klingon or, or Tristan Newton or Cam Spencer might've had an off night and did not matter even in the slightest. They were absolutely outstanding. Um, but shout out to Nate Oates and Alabama. I think they will be back. Um, I think they are, we'll talk about, where the sec stands after the the cow news and all that stuff oh my god we'll get um, into which, that in a second what a <laughs> what a news drop in between the the final Nuts. four and the national title Nuts. on the day the the women's championship but that um, was insane but yeah but that, yeah i the, do i will shout out nato as well this this is i i kind of went into the tournament thinking um that there is some weight to this theory that in march madness defense wins championships but defenses get better like if you have a bad defense it can get better what really matters is your offensive efficiency against pace like that's something that i was like okay maybe this this has some weight and there were some snail teams that just weren't a fit like virginia for instance where it's just an yeah. automatic loss and then alabama who was the most efficient offense all year and played at an insanely fast pace that the fact that they made the final four and played a pretty tough game against UConn, probably the hardest game UConn faced in that 12 game stretch of dominance uh, these past two years. I think that that right there solidifies that that's kind of something you need to look at. Like when you're making your bracket, when you're looking at teams, looking at trends, not a lot of people talk about that. It's a lot of, you know, the kill shot, it, you know, um, you have to be top 30 on Kempom and this and that. I think, you know, because UConn offensively, they're, they were like the second or third most efficient team. And Purdue was up there as well. Like, 
it, it made a lot of sense that um, we saw Alabama go this far. And I think Nate Oates, the way he runs his offense, the NBA style, um, you know, threes and layups only, I think it's here to stay, right? And maybe he goes to Kentucky, but um, if he doesn't, Alabama absolutely will be will be good. Mark Sears might come back too, so. Yeah, which uh, crazy. Um, and then on the other side of the final four, DJ Burns and, and shout out. I know DJ Burns got all the love. DJ Horn had an unbelievable tournament. An yeah, unbelievable so tournament. Yeah. He was there. He, in my opinion, he was North Carolina's best player. Like I, I thought he was absolutely outstanding for them all tournament long. Um, unfortunately that, you know, NC State just couldn't keep up with Purdue and they, they pressured I mean, Purdue's they played, guards a little bit. Like they 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 played looked well solid, defensively but, for sure, but they played horrific offensively. Like yeah. that was the middle of January NC State offense that we saw. Um well, and their and point again, guard got think, hurt, and I think that really yeah, just kind of set them off the rails. Hurt, it seemed like from again, I I watched the full game um, afterwards, like the Sunday during the day. I was like, I just have to. I'm watching film, and yep. I I mean, you could tell that like there's something just clicked uh, in a bad way for NC State, where Michael O'Connell goes down, nothing was working. It was just like this moment where they were like, Oh no, he's hurt. We're gonna lose, and. And that's what happened. So, yeah, but yeah, not that fun of a game. Um, and, and we talked about it last episode. We talked about it two episodes ago. Um, you know, this, this wasn't the best tournament, right? March Madness is always amazing. It's always electric. Yep. You know, we had King Kong versus Godzilla in the championship and it was really fun for a while, but in general, you look even back to last year where you have FAU buzzer beater, Julian Strother, Gonzaga over UCLA, you know, uh, just yeah, Purdue losing to FU, like just so much classic March Madness that this tournament just felt a little bit dry. And then, of course, you get the number one overall seed wins it all, and they win by 13 points or more in every game again. it That's just not fun. So, yeah. um, again, amazing year of college basketball and champ week was incredible we had so much oh chaos. yeah Champions, championship week was right? awesome like i feel bad for the people that were like didn't watch that and just watch march madness because we had our fair share of chaos i i hate the concept of people wanting to expand the tournament and the oh, reason yeah. being is championship week is just an extension of march madness and we saw mm-hmm. that this year you go into championship week And there are very few teams that do not have a shot. And honestly, the ones that don't, it's the Ivy League because the Ivy League only has a four-team tournament that's super weird with what they do. 99.9% of teams are are alive. They can make it. They could win it all. Uh, As of March 10th, they can win it all still. They just need to market championship week better because god damn it that was some of the best basketball we watched all year i mean depaul had three wins and they almost they should have beat villanova can you imagine the scenes if depaul like strung together a couple wins that i mean we would be arguing to our graves like you you can be that bad yeah still maybe sneak like is this the worst tournament team of all time like yeah it would have been, yeah, they'd be been nuts. a 16 seed power five team, like, or power 16. That'd be nuts. So, um, you know, we had the NC State run. Uh, we had the Oregon run. Both those teams, I don't think, would have made it. Apparently, New Mexico wouldn't have made it either, which mm-hmm. is insane. But, um, you know, again, that's bracketology. The selection committee was a bit flawed this year. But, yes, like, from March 1st on, it was fantastic because we had just a beautiful champ week and we had some really good games in the tournament. But to the people, the casual fan that was tuning into March Madness, like, oh, man, this is the best time of the year. It might have been a letdown. I, I And I don't judge you if you say it was a letdown because I kind of think it was as well. Um, I just was watching college basketball since November and yeah. witnessed so much, you know, parody and chaos that I, I was I reached uh, content status a long time ago, probably like late January. I was like, this is great. Like I've seen enough. I've seen it all. It's awesome. So, yeah, I I will say 
because of this show and the, and the podcast, I've watched more college basketball this year than I ever have, which is, yeah. And I, you know, what, and it's been guys, awesome. I can, I, I can guarantee I loved you it. enjoyed the hell out of it. I you can guarantee it. You're absolutely right. And I will do it again next year. Um, yeah, I can't wait. Let, so <laughs> let's talk the national national title game. Um, there were 12 minutes where I was having maybe the most fun I've ever had watching college basketball. Oh, the 12-minute the span where there were, I think it was like eight lead changes. The largest lead change or the largest lead was like only three points. It was the most back and forth, like mono e mono. What like UConn was getting great looks at the rim. Edie was just an absolute man. He was like he, he the, the he had the baby hooks. Like he was just feeling himself. He that, got to his spot. Yeah. That 12 that minute stretch. Gun. Oh, oh, it was disgusting. Like it, was fire, it was just fire me up. Braden Smith was like, it's just the pick and roll. They were throwing lobs. Wheeling and dealing. Just, and, and they were making. Yeah, he had the duck. Edie had the two blocks like on the same yeah, possession the at the defensive end. Eagles, like, like, and don't then, go in there. Yeah. yeah. And then, uh, which, first off, Ian Eagle did a hell of a job. Like, I miss Jim Nance. I love Jim Nance. I will listen to Jim Nance call the Masters this weekend and have a great time. But, oh, I can't wait. I can't wait. Ian Eagle did a hell of a job. That, he did, like, yeah. And... But the, the, those 12 minutes, that game was awesome. I think Purdue played as close to a uh, – maybe the best half of basketball they had played all year. And they went into halftime down six. And, and as soon as we saw yeah. that, I texted you, and I was like, Purdue just played close to, like, their best shot, and, and they were down. I was like – that. The, it's over, are. and the same. You could have said the same thing about Alabama in the Final Four, where Alabama yeah. was playing brilliant offense. Just they were giving it their all, and they were still losing. What does that do to you? Like, like Zach Eady was putting on a show. It was a masterclass. I, I mean, he was the Player of the Year, and he played maybe like his best stretch of basketball all year against Donovan Klingon, who people said, you know, just wait till Zach Eady has to play Klingon, he's going to be exposed. And Edie's proving the doubters wrong. I, t- I was texting people like, like how how do people not enjoy Zach Edie's game? Because this is beautiful. Yeah. He's just dominating right now. And they then to go into half down six. So on to the second half. Purdue went on, I think they went on like a three or four minute stretch where they just couldn't score. It, it was brutal. They Purdue only went, they went one for seven from three, which is wild. But they also only shot seven threes, which is insane for how Purdue played all year. I, I think I, I don't know what halftime adjustments were made, if any, whatever. You know, I I don't know the insides of that locker room, but you put it perfectly. It, they they just turtled into Edie. They were just like Edie, help us. And well, it's the, it's the Matt Painter zombies. We've seen it before, right? And <laughs> I love that terminology because it genuinely. Like it happened against FDU and it bothered me so much. I, it happened before the tournament last year as well at times where I'm like, God, like, I hate this team. This team is dead to me. Um, you know, because when, like when they're playing well, they look so good. But then if they're down like three, you know, there's no creativity. It's, mm-hmm. you know, pass the ball around, run the freaking weave drill until you can get an entry pass to Edie, and then he gets to his right shoulder, puts up a hook shot, you know, bricks it because he didn't have good position, and then just rinse and repeat. Um, and, like, when it's working, like it worked in the first half, it opens things up, right? You could see a little more drive and kick, um, some mm-hmm. lob plays. But then they just became, like, like you know, the, the robots, the zombie robots, where it's just like, oh, all right, coach, like, whatever you say, and let's just pass it in. And then if it doesn't work, you look at coach, you're like, oh, I don't know. Um, so, the, and, and it was always going to be Purdue's demise. It was always going to be their demise, um, you know, but like they shouldn't, shouldn't hang their heads. They made it to the final. It's just, I'm not surprised it happened. Yeah. I, I truly think this Purdue team was one of the, they were one of the best 10 teams we've seen in the last decade. Hmm. Interesting. Okay. But they ran into maybe the best team we've seen in the last decade. Like they are, uh, they are true. I truly like this Purdue team quite a bit. I think they were outstanding. They played phenomenal basketball all year. 
They lost a couple like true road games, but outside of that, they played really, really tremendous basketball. And they ran into, in my opinion, the best college basketball team I've seen in the last decade. Now, I, wow. I, I think you could put 2018 Villanova against them, I think is yeah. the, the, the argument. But the fact that we're having that argument is pretty insane. UConn went on a two, they've now covered the spread every single game in two straight tournaments. That's, well, that's unbelievable. Well, what we have to do is we have to wait and see, maybe give it two years and see um, whether or not these players pan out in the NBA. Because for Villanova, you know, pretty quickly you saw Josh Hart, Mikhail Bridges, even Eric Pascal, uh early days on the Warriors was popping off. Yeah. Jalen Brunson. Um, you know, just DiVincenzo. Like DiVincenzo, it was, it yeah. Was the whole team was, you know, playing 20 minutes a game in the NBA. It was crazy, and they all still are, which just, to me, makes me look back at that 2018 Villanova team and say, like, that might have to be the best because watching them play, it was like, oh, my God, man, how do you beat them? UConn's the same way, but we don't have that feel of, like, man, this is a lock star mm-hmm. in, in the pros. Um, but maybe there's a world where Tristan Newton is actually really good in the pros and Klingon is, is really, really good. And Stephon Castle. Is I was going to say, you know? I think Castle might be the best, best of the bunch. He was playing such terrific defense that entire game. Like I, I understand Tristan Newton got the MVP. He deserved it. He played outstanding basketball in the final four, but Stephon Castle played unbelievable defense like i i don't yeah. know we we now have to i i think is dan hurley the best coach in the sport or is it still bill self because i i oh, think it's, it's dan hurley it's dan hurley for me he's, i i i think it can't be questioned at this point because i mean i love bill self but like it you can't question it i've never seen kansas do nonetheless just what dan hurley's done one time with uconn yeah. dan hurley back to back twice um, and again, he's doing it with guys that we're not sure they're going to be NBA guys because there's also a world where none of them pan out and we're looking back and we're just singing Hurley's praises saying, how the hell did he get that team to do, you know, numbers, put yeah. up numbers like that, right? And th- this is the first back-to-back <clears throat> since that Florida team, that Florida team returned all five of their starters from the national championship team the year prior. Yeah, this UConn team did Adama nothing, nothing of Hawkins. the sort. Yeah, yeah. I think and they lost. They got huge pieces like Stephon Castle and Cam Spencer are massive. Yeah, and Klingon grew. Like I'm not surprised. Um, like I honestly think that this team might have been better than last year. But oh, I, I think they absolutely were. I, th- yeah. I think they absolutely are. But it's 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 still interesting. And again, to bring it back to the national championship game, when you have a guy like Stephon Castle, you know defensively giving it his all as a five-star recruit, um, you know, who didn't have to sell his soul out for Hurley's system, but he did, right? And that's a testament to Hurley. But also, Purdue's guards, like Fletcher Lawyer was 0 for 5 from 3. I don't even know if he scored. Um, I like, don't think he did. just too small, and I think that's why I'm like, I don't know if I would agree with Purdue being a top-10 team in the past decade because, um, you know, what they did – against in, in the non-con was insane and so impressive. Um, but like, you know, maybe the big 10 was a little weak this year. Maybe, you know, like did, did they actually have this lineup of specimens that were just clicking and in unison that were just like, I, it, they'd be around that range, but I'm not sure just. Yeah. It, it'd be close. I'm willing to say. I yeah. think it'd be close. That that being said, a very fun season. Dan Hurley, um, you UConn is a blue blood. They are a blue oh, yeah. blood. They they are. At, I understand. They don't have the history. I don't give a shit what kind of history. They have more national titles than Duke. Well, it's like That's, the Patriots. The Patriots were horrific yeah. for like the entirety of the NFL until they made their first Super Bowl in like '97. Yeah, and then boom, they won like six or seven, whatever it is in the turn of the century, UConn, same thing where they're an afterthought and then they're amazing. But when you think of NFL's best, most historic franchises, you think of the Patriots because of what they've done. 
you're going to have to think of UConn. Whether, if you're an old head, I'm sorry. That's just how it works. Um, one last thing that we didn't mention uh, is, is Camden Heidi with the most unexpected play that... I've ever seen in sports history. That <laughs> I got off. I was, I jumped off. I yelled so loud that like, I thought my dog like heard a gunshot. Like I, I was, <laughs> I jumped up. It was legitimately, that was the most unexpected play. I think I've ever seen in all of sports. Seriously. Yeah. I never would have been able to tell you like, Oh, like that could be a put back, to, like put back tomahawk. <laughs> Off of, a, off of a off Zach Eady like miss that was oh right next God. to like it wasn't like it off a three or something correct it just a no nope. truly <laughs> unfathomable play that came out of nowhere I and like I, that should be talked about for so long like they oh, should dude, I, I'm gonna watch that dunk back like for the rest of my life I have it saved to my pop, phone because it was so insane I literally screen recorded it and had I posted it on my Instagram and I'm just I look back on my camera roll I'm like oh my god that's insane I watch it over and over because the the crowd pop and Ian Eagle like his yeah. calling and Bill Raftery like when all of the announcers in unison are like oh my god and the crowd's like going crazy like yeah, uh, there, that was that, and the game was honestly like trending towards over at that point. Yep. And then that play happens, and you're like, "Wait, what? Like, yep, <laughs> maybe not. Like that. I didn't know he had it like that. I wasn't familiar with his game. Uh, apparently, he's a 41 inch vertical, and he's a true freshman. So, good sign for Purdue fans in the future. Yep. Um, that it. That was the the nail in the coffin, or not the nail in the coffin, because that was a bad. That's like a bad thing. But that that was the final like crown jewel of the white boys we back basketball yeah. season <laughs> in uh, college. What hoops. a season! For we the white we boys had fans. we had Dalton connect. We had a Braden Smith, um, and then a Cam- Camden Heidi Heidel. Camden Heidi, yeah, Camden Heidi. Just uh, absolutely I mean, not to me- like there are a plethora. Oh yeah, of, of uh, names. Marcus Damask. Like yeah, there, there have been some dudes. And, uh, let's see. We got. I'm gonna go through it real quick for you. So uh, Tyler Kolek, Hunter Dickinson, yep. PJ Hall, yep. Domas, Grant Nelson. Yep. Um, you know, connect. Obviously, you had Reed Shepard. Reed Shepard. Yeah, he was. You uh, had. He was the number one pick in the NBA draft for like three weeks there. No, he's crazy. still like projected <laughs> top three, which is just bonkers because. Yeah, you know that Reed Shepard before the season, like I, I think I heard an interview where he was like, like I'm prepared to be like the water boy, like the, the, yeah, you know, recruiting class is too stacked. I'm not going to be playing, and now he's going to be top three in the draft. Like in his head, I think there's a chance he comes back. He shouldn't, but it, like he pissed down his leg against Oakland. I don't know if he's ready. Yeah. So, regardless, Kyle Filipowski, you had like Spencer Johnson on BYU, Klingon, Cormac Ryan, Baylor Shireman, um, you know. That yep. Braden Smith, Fletcher Lawyer, Tucker DeVries, Kalkbrenner, Mom Silovich, um, Oh, I, yeah. Cam, Cam Spencer. Oh, Robbie Cam Avila, Stanford. bro. Kareem Abdul yeah, Jabbar. Avila, um, some guys like Patrick Cartier, some Utah guys. Um, just overall, it was, it was genuinely, it felt even. It felt like, like it was, you know, a completely equally di- diverse sport this year and i loved it and i hope that no one thinks that that's wrong that i say that because i think that's it's perfect <laughs> it's the perfect storm to have it completely diverse i don't so yeah it was great but we'll see if it continues i i hope it does yep yep a very, very fun season. And um, the people it was probably the most fun for, at least in terms of our bracket challenge, are the winners. Um, first off, we had 433 people join our bracket challenge. That's legitimately insane. So thank you to everyone um, who joined. Uh, there are people with much, much larger followings than what Nick and I have Um who who have much small or who had much smaller bracket challenges so thank you guys so much for joining um we absolutely will be doing more giveaways in the future so super super excited for that um we gotta we gotta do the giveaways right so the top three 
Yes. First is getting, I'm just going to toss first place. And I shouted him out on yep. Instagram. I don't remember his username, but I have my $150 home field apparel gift card. You know, go to the link in my bio or Cody's bio. Um, smash, you know, code smash or code Nick 15. You get 15% off. But who, I don't, again, I, I wish I wrote his name, his username down, but $150 so I, to him. I have him up. So the okay. $150 winner is Starry Milligan um, on right. IG. Congratulations. Um, and then Skyler J918, you are the second place winner. So you, you will be getting the $50 gift card. And then Zeke Battier um, will be getting the $25 gift card. So we absolutely will be doing more giveaways in the future. Um, we will reach out to, to y'all on IG. So, so don't worry about that. Um, but that being said, we have 433 people in the um, group and not even 400 subscribers on the YouTube channel. So subscribe to the YouTube channel. Subscribe to the YouTube channel. Like this video. Subscribe to the YouTube channel. Um, yeah. But excited to do those giveaways. Um, and if you did not win the giveaway, you can still have a chance at some awesome, awesome, awesome home field apparel. Use code Nick15 to save 15% on Home Field's website. They put up shirts for the they put up championship shirts for UConn and South Carolina already. And they are they are fire. They are better than what the standard ones that the, the teams come up with. So um Absolutely go take a look at those if you are um, a fan of either of those two teams. But speaking of the women's Final Four national title game, um, the Final Four was okay. Uh, South Carolina absolutely obliterated NC State, which that that was the easiest layup in, in sports betting. I, I think I got them at like minus 11 and a half maybe. It, that yeah. was they, – they obliterated them. Yeah, um, tough, tough final four for the Wolf Bat, NC State, yeah. you know, fans, you know, just to not play in a close game. That's, but to make it there is all is already amazing. Yeah, but if you were to tell NC State fans, it's like, hey, both your men's and your women's team are going to be in the final four this year. Yeah. They, hands down, you <laughs> no, take that. They, yeah. they are not, like, upset, obviously. But yeah. during the games, um, you know, you might just be like, oh, God damn, you know. Yeah. Um, but that you ran into – some really, really good basketball teams. Um, I didn't, I didn't get to watch South Carolina, NC State, but I did watch the entirety of, of UConn, UConn, Iowa. Iowa. Yeah, I, I watched. Fantastic. I watched the first ten minutes of the South Carolina, NC State game, and then I was like, okay, this is over. I'm gonna go. I was actually at the pool I was at, like, bar. The so center. it's just the wedding yeah. weekend. It made it really tough, but yep, I did get home yeah. in time to watch the main event, and it was, it did not disappoint. Yeah. And to all the people that are like, wow, like what a great game ruined by a foul call at the end. I, to an extent, agree that like you kind of, I would love to see the refs just let the girls play, let the boys play, whatever it yeah. is. You know, if, if they don't call that foul though, and Paige Becker's like hits a game winning three, then the whole thing is reversed. I am yeah. a fan of freaking out. Twitter is still going crazy. A blaze, Yeah. Right, because they would have looked really deep into it. She she set moment. that screen like there was. She, she absolutely yeah, moved. Her hips were her hips were way farther out than her shoulders. Right. Yeah. Um. And and, and her elbow was flared. Like you can't. Yeah. It like, sucks to rule, end a game that like that. But damn it, that was a moving screen. It sucks. Exactly. But it is what so it is. I I don't. I'm not gonna look back at that game and think like, you know, first thing I think about is not gonna be that foul call because. Um, you know, Nika Mule, like UConn coming back, hitting that big three to cut one. Yeah, everyone. off that, that steal, that was up. crazy. Oh, I, that was, I was nuts. I, stood up. I was, I was like, oh my god, this is insane. Um, you know, Caitlin Clark and Beckers were kind of getting, you know, they were getting doubled or at least yeah denied oh, yeah. off ball. Yep. And and so all these other people like Kate Martin down the stretch, that was nuts, right? She was just hitting the dirk fadeaway left and right. Yep. Um. You know, Sydney Falter, uh, uh, Hannah Stolke, right? The Iowa big. Yes. Yeah. Unbelievable, dude. That was with the I space realized. buns. Like, okay. She's she's good. She's I, I think she's young too. Like I think she might be like sophomore. freshman or sophomore. Yeah. The sophomore. But I went through this women's college basketball season. Obviously, I didn't watch that much because you know it's hard to it's hard to watch it all. 
Okay? Yeah, but it's hard to watch everything. I did not know that Iowa was kind of loaded in general. Yeah. Like, I kind of assumed one seed, Caitlin Clark, is single-handedly the reason why, and she's playing with some girls that, like, she just has to hope and pray will get buckets if she can't. Not like that at all, man. Like, Hannah Stolke could grab a bucket whenever. Like, that. that is a great starting five. So, that was – that was an awesome game. It was an awesome yep. game. The yep. championship itself, not necessarily, um, you know, the, the most high-end basketball I've ever seen. South Carolina is just too dominant. It was a similar thing yeah. to UConn. It was, it was, two, it two was teams a, a were... very, very similar game. Like, Iowa put up a hell of a fight in the first half, and then they just ran out of gas. They could not keep up with South Carolina's depth. Cardoso absolutely fucking bullied them on the boards. She is yeah, a she's machine. Big. She's, she's yeah, elite. and you. It was hard to compete. Like not only like not only the size in terms of height, but the strength that she has. Like she would just it, like if you, she would just dominate position. Like she she would get that position both offensively or defensively, and she would yeah. put you right where she wanted you. Mm-hmm. A, a phenomenal game. Don Staley is a hell of a hell of a coach. Um, we've seen Gino Ariema dominate the women's basketball scene for a while, and it seems like women have had um a, a really great run of like they because notre dame had muffet mcgraw and tennessee had pat summit and then yukon had gino and now south carolina has don staley and she is going to be a force there for a long long time um well this is her third unless, national title unless unless she takes the kentucky job a team in kentucky wants to go give don staley that would ball. be i i don't think I think there are would, certain areas of the. I think there are certain areas of the country where you could have a women's head basketball coach. I don't think it, it, Kentucky is. One I don't of those. think you can't. You can't be uh, a yeah. team that expects to recruit high level and have a women's head coach either. As great as Don Staley is, you would see a a massive slide. Um, you know, just from a sense of like, I do not relate. In, in the sense, right, like to the, to yeah. my head coach, if it's if it's Don Staley, but if Don Staley really wanted to like push boundaries, I think she could succeed at a mid major team. I oh, really I really do. Oh yeah. my god, I, I think she could fantastic. succeed at the right high major team, just not not Kentucky. Those fans are insane. Maybe. Like, I don't you would, know. High major is tough. It, I, I think you could tough. if you got the right the right. It would have to be like a a great like setting and city and supporting. Uh, you can't be in the. I don't think you could do it in the South. I I don't think. No, but again, like I I just don't know. Yeah. Like maybe like if she took over a roster and no one transferred out and like she had recruits, yeah. she could absolutely lead that team to you know something crazy if it's a high major. But over the year year over year, um, yeah. I, I I don't think on a high major it would work. She would definitely in my like just she yeah if she went to like an Indiana State or something. I think we could talk about like oh my god. Like this is the best mid major program in the country, blah blah blah. So, yeah. um, but I don't. We're not going to see it happen. It, it's fun to yeah. talk about. Fun hypothetical. I'd love, see, I'd love to see if if we'll we'll transition right now into the coaching carousel because it's crazy. But, but I'd love to see her get a call. That'd be awesome. Yeah. John Calipari to Arkansas, insanity. We touched on it just for a second. Yeah. What was your like, guttural reaction when it happened? Um, because I texted you. I was like, oh my god. Um, I. But we didn't like go in depth. I was surprised, but I wasn't as surprised as I thought I would be. Like they they made the announcement that Cal was coming back, and it was like that didn't seem like the end of it. The Kentucky's AD was like, "Yep, Cal's coming back. He's our coach," and that was like the entire statement. And I was like, "Okay, well this this still and like the rumors never stopped. Like they were like." Kentucky could call Scott Drew. Kentucky could call Dan Hurley. Kentucky could call, you know, Billy Donovan. And I think, honestly, I think this is the right move for everybody. I I think Cal needs that. He was there for what, 15 years. Like, I I think that he had a hell of a run at Kentucky. He brought them a lot of success, a lot of wins, a lot of fame, like only one national title, which I know kills people. But at the same time, the amount of Final Fours and success and everything well, you he brought take, that Kentucky you take program is 2012, great. 2012, 2014, 2015. 
that was a uh, dominance in college yeah. basketball. Even though you only got one championship, you played, you, you won a championship in 2012, then you played in a championship in 2014, and then you were undefeated going into the Final Four in 2015. And, yeah. Like, the recruiting was off the charts. It was, at that point, like, going into the 2016 season, it was like Kentucky is easily the cream of the crop. And John Calipari is the reason why. So, yes, he lost to Oakland and St. Peter's um, and kind of just struggled in the tournament down the stretch here. A lot of people were saying it's just because he's too off the ball coaching, right? He's kind Mm -hmm. of like relies on the talent. He doesn't want to run a specific system. Um, But he's still a storied, you know, brilliant college basketball coach. And Arkansas is going like, if I'm an Arkansas fan, I'm ecstatic. You have to. Yeah, you have to be. And if you're a Kentucky fan, that's like a top three job in college sports. So you're going to get someone that's going to make you happy. And then both sides are happy. I truly think this is the weirdest coaching carousel ever because it's all started because the PAC 12 sucks. And because the PAC 12 sucks, the conferences are falling apart and therefore SMU is going to the ACC. And because they're going to the ACC, they now need to compete in basketball. So they fire their head coach and they hire USC's head coach. And because USC doesn't have a head coach, they hire Eric Musselman. And now Arkansas hires Calipari. So all because the PAC 12 commissioner sucks ass. John Calipari is in Arkansas. And now I, but I truly think like, USC is happy. They got Mus. SMU is happy. They got a, a better head coach and are moving to the ACC. Arkansas is happy because they have Cal. And Kentucky's happy that Cal's out. And they, like, if they get, I don't know who they're going to get. We'll see. And, and I'm you sure it'll be announced Scott in the Drew. next couple if of days. A, Scott Drew, Nate Oates, TJ Otzelberger, Billy Donovan, Jay Wright. Like, whether yeah. you see any or none of those as, as, as realistic, that's the type of head coach that Kentucky's going to get. They're not going to yeah. go get, you know, um, like Steve Alford from Nevada. That's not yeah. – that's – like Kentucky's bigger than that. They're going to get a top-tier guy. And normally, because we've talked about this before, where um, I think like Texas A&M football fired Jimbo or something, and we were like looking at what people were saying, like, oh, like Dabo to A&M, like could – this guy go to AM, it's like, are you insane? Right? Like, that's just not going to happen. If, and they got, you know, uh, the guy from Duke, what's his name? Mike, Mike Elko. Elko. Yep. Um, and like, I think that's great. But Texas, a- like, Texas a and not Kentucky in basketball, right? Like, that's as if Alabama, when Nick Saban retired, they were going to get a top guy from a top program. And they got Kalen DeBoer, who just took Washington to the finals. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So Kentucky's going to have the same thing happen. If you're a Kentucky fan, you're happy. What I think would be hilarious is imagine Kentucky's like YOLO, let's throw Eric Musselman the bag. And then yeah. <laughs> Musselman just leaves USC without, you know, even arriving get, and then goes to Kentucky and it's Kentucky. just a complete swap. That'd be, That'd be wild. But obviously that won't happen. But we will see a ripple effect from Cal, um, you know, going to Arkansas because now, say, Scott Drew goes from Baylor yeah, to Kentucky. Then who fills that Baylor job? And then whoever does is probably going to be a maybe still a high major. So then who fills that? Yeah. We're just going to see. And and the players are going to follow. Like Yeah. You know, say the tra- you've Walton already stays, seen the transfer transfers. portal and all it, that stuff. It's going to be bonkers. Yeah, it's so going to be absolutely ball, bonkers. Mark Madness is over, but it is not. It is. We are, yep. we are in the thick of the chaos. It's just, it's kind of off off script, a little off, off the screen chaos, um, and it won't really die down until the end of April, which is why Rothstein says we sleep in May. Yep. We sleep in May. Cody. Yep. Which, how crazy is it if I would have told you in 2015 after, um, you know, Kentucky is making Final Four runs and Alabama's winning, you know, maybe it's their third, maybe it's their fourth title under under Saban that uh, Saban and Cal would be gone from Kentucky and Alabama in the same year. Within yeah. four months of each other. Wild. Yep. Nuts. Wild. Um, but let, let's yeah. talk transfers and, a little and, bit. And, and Belichick, right? Yeah. Yeah. And Bill Belichick. Crazy. Yeah. If you want to add Belichick, like if you said in, let's say 2016, um, right, because Alabama beat Clemson in January of 2016, Coach Cal, the season prior, had Kentucky undefeated in, in the Final Four. And Bill Belichick had just 
you know, beat the Seahawks um, yeah. on that Malcolm Butler interception. So these three coaches are just at the top of their game. If you were like in, in less than a decade, they're all gone within four months. That would be, I would have said, yeah. you're a, you're a witch. I would have burned you at, at the stake. <laughs> yep. Absolutely crazy. Um, let, let's talk transfer portal just briefly. Um, there are guys moving all over the place. It is absolute chaos on the transfer portal, but it's kind of what we expected. Um, my sweet, sweet Robbie Avila, um, entered the transfer portal. I will say he entered the transfer portal with no contact. I think it is. Yeah. He's almost, going to St. Louis. Yeah. He's, he's going to St. Louis to stay with his head coach. So, um, which, you know, we get a 10 Robbie and I'm fine with that. Yep. I'm happy with a 10 Robbie. Cause I like the a 10, um, you know, Missouri Valley is awesome as well, but, um, I, what I want to do, Cody, just we'll do like five minutes, um, and change maybe here. I'm just going to give you some of these big names in the portal and give you the team that I personally think they might be leaning towards. Um, okay. Now, some of that might be gut call, minimal, you know, actual like um, thesis evidence to it. That's fine. Some of it is, is there's some real good evidence. I actually think it's definitely going to happen type vibe. Yep. You just tell me. If you think it's a good fit, would it make you happy? Just sort of just react live because I'm not sure okay. how, how kept up you are into these rumors. But I had a long car ride car ride today, so I had a lot of time to kind of work through this in my head. We'll start with Umar Ballo, um, who I think on 24-7 is the highest rated player in the transfer portal at a, you know, 98 out of 100 rating. Um, yep. I see... Alabama potentially in his future. Ooh, I, I think that would be a good fit. Um, obviously very, very talented. This Alabama team is going to bring, I think they're going to bring a good portion of that team back. I think Grant Nelson is, is going to be back. Um, we Mark could, it's Mark Sears and, Sears and Nelson are good. Yeah. Yeah. But it's easy for both. But I, I do think that would be a really good fit um, in, in NATO to scheme. I think that would be really like that'd be a really fun, fun, fun team. So, um, yeah. yeah. The only thing that worries me is like he he cannot stretch the floor, and yeah. Alabama just loves playing that stretch the floor you know type of offense. But you have to have a presence down low. You have to have like what Nick Pringle. Um, or yeah, I think that might have been like I know Nick Pringle is definitely a guy on that team. I'm blanking because I think they had another center as well, um, who I just yeah, I don't remember. Freak athlete, seven footer. I mean, yeah, I, like I guys be... that like they had guys that played down low, and I think Ballo is just an upgrade there. And I think whoever they had it was like a redshirt senior. So yeah, I see that. I see Nate Oates if he stays in Alabama, being like, you know what? Let's let's rip the NIL. We made the Final Four. We got this TV revenue. Let's let's go make a splash and convince some guys to return and, and go do it again. So yep. I see that. What about, and this one I, I was reading on Twitter, and there's a little bit of weight to this, John L. Davis to Houston. That's interesting. That, that That's really interesting because the, the initial thought is, is like, well, is he going to follow his guy to Michigan, um, Dusty May? And I think there's some credence to that, but I also think there's some credence to like John L. Davis being that good of a player that, I don't know if he wants to go to a Michigan team that isn't ready to, they're not going to be ready to compete next year. So yeah, not year one. And he's, I, he, you know, he's been there, done that with his coach. He might, yeah, he might try to explore. He could go to the draft as well, but yeah, he's a very talented player, but I like the fit in Houston. I think that would be, cause I, is shed coming back. If he does, then Houston is far and away the team to beat. Yeah. I, I've seen a lot of way Donald too Davis. early. I've seen a lot of way too early top 25s with Houston being at number one. Um, my assumption was that, you know, they have LJ Cryer and, and Shed coming back. Um, if they had John they L. Have Davis. Sharp, Sharp and Cryer and Tugler and uh, Javier Francis and Arsenal, who was hurt. He like tore his Achilles. They, and again, with Kelvin Sampson, you know, that defense is, is going to be a machine. Going to be, they, yeah. They, you had a score like Davis. Houston, I like maybe that a lot. If Shed doesn't get hurt, maybe Houston 
um, you know, wins. Like we, we can't, it could have, it's a, it feels crazy because UConn was that good, but man, I would have loved to see a UConn Houston matchup. Like what yeah. could have UConn done against that defense? Oh, that would have been awesome. Yep. That would have been so awesome. It crushes me. All right. But if they got John L Davis, I think that gives them a massive boost offensively. Um, because they weren't that fast paced. They were kind of a no. methodical, great defensive team, but you know, they've been faster in the past, like when they made their final four run in 2021 um, mm-hmm. with, you know, Marcus Sasser and they've had like Rob Gray, Quentin Grimes guys in the past that were, you know, NBA ready from, from the offensive side of the ball. And I think John L. Davis absolutely would, would be tops on their roster as far as going to get a bucket. Um, and I think that would just be massive for them. So that would be yep. fascinating. Um, I'm seeing Clifford Amarui from Rutgers going to Arkansas. There are rumors that Aaron Bradshaw is actually going to go to Rutgers because he's like best friends with Dylan Harper. Ooh. And so that would be Rutgers. Rutgers is a sleeping giant next year. Yeah. Especially if they get the sixth overall recruit from 2022. Um, So I can see like Kentucky's, Big, I think everyone was like, well, welcome to Arkansas, Aaron Bradshaw, yeah. because Calipari left. But I'm seeing he might actually be leaning Ar- uh, Rutgers, which now opens up Arkansas to go get a big. They're going to make a splash because they just got yep. this new head coach. They also, I'm pretty sure, have like zero people on their roster right now. Yeah. So they're going to spend. And I can see Amarui being a guy for them there. Vlad Golden, FAU Center, Michigan, seems like a lock there. Yeah. Um, there's... Guys like Trey Townsend or Great Osibor that are being rumored to Michigan State. Yeah, I I think I, I've seen um oh who the hell was it um G Fed talk about Townsend going to to Michigan State. Um, apparently that like he's from that. I obviously he's from Michigan, um, going to Oakland, but I, I think there is some credence to Michigan I think he's State from, being like, interested in. Like yeah. he's, he grew up a fan. Um, so yeah, it's the, the only problem with that is that he's not a true five. Xavier Booker, also not really a true five. Great Osibor would be an easy true five for them. So mm-hmm. m- maybe there's a world to get both. Um, Miles Rice, you know, Washington state star yeah. breakout point guard, seeing Indiana for cancer him. ass kicker, Miles Rice. Cancer um, ass kicker. Yeah. That would be, that would be really interesting for Rice. Cause Indiana needs shooters. They they need some shooters bad. And I like I mean they're they're going to lose um Kalel Ware to the draft, but I don't re- I don't love this Indiana roster and we'll see. They had their best commit decommitted um th- but they got another five star oh, in his Liam, place. Liam McNeely, but yeah, yeah they got Liam McNeely else. decommitted. So I I'm Curious to I think there's going they're, to be quite a bit of change over in this Indiana roster this year. They're 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 top four for a lot of of guys in the transfer portal right now. Mm-hmm. So that you know, they, they could be crazy next year. Aiden Holloway, Auburn star freshman guard, who is awesome yeah. today announced he was going to the transfer portal. So I think I saw Michigan. I think people were saying Michigan there. Mm-hmm. I think that'd be cool. Um, that would help that program a ton, help Dusty May, especially if they don't get John L. Davis. Yep. And then the last one, really, is um, Kay Tyson, who is like a Belmont 6'8 six, six, wing that was averaging like 18 and 7 on Belmont and has been rumored to like North Carolina, Duke, Kentucky, like all these blue bloods. Damn. But the fun fact here is that it's Hunter Tyson's younger brother. Hunter Tyson five-year guy at Clemson Hmm. went to the draft, you know, Hmm. which not a lot of Clemson guys are developed into draftees. Yeah. Um, So I think if Hunter Tyson is behind Cade's ear a little bit saying like, listen, it was great for me in every sense of the word. Then I, I don't see how, like, how can he turn it down? Right. So, you know, obviously there's money, but there are ties like aggressive ties yeah. to Clemson considering he visited all the time. Um, and that would be really cool for Clemson. 
that's pretty much it. But again, like there are a ton more names I didn't even talk about. Yeah, um, there are some that have committed. Um, Michi Johnson going from South Carolina to Ohio State. I think is a big, to, big get. Back to Ohio back State. To Ohio. Yeah, he was there for – he was at Ohio State, transferred to South Carolina, and now he's back at Ohio State. He must have fucking hated uh, – oh, fuck, who's our coach that got fired? Chris Holtman. Um, right. And then, yeah, yeah who else do we got? Um, Brandon Huntley Hatfield going from Louisville to NC State, um, I, I think is yep. is interesting. Um, and Zeke then, Mayo to Kansas. Zeke Mayo to Kansas from, from South Someone Dakota State. Kansas. Uh, I'm not sure. I don't remember. Um, Tucker DeVry. We didn't talk about him. Speaking of the downfall of the MVC with Robbie Avila, he committed to West Virginia. Well, that's, that's where his dad went. Yeah. Right. Which is, is, is pretty no. crazy. So, um, yeah, the, the, the transfer portal, it doesn't stop. Um, but speaking of things in the past, Let's go to our recapping our preseason takes a little bit. Um, let's just give our worst take and our best take. Um, okay. My, uh, I'm going to start with. I'm going to start with my worst take. My worst take was that Gonzaga would sleepwalk to a WCC title. I do remember. I remember. I, yeah. I, I said that they would sleepwalk to a WCC title. I said Gonzaga at minus 125 to win the WCC was the easiest bet in the world. I said, you could, you could put your kid's college fund on that. Um, and that didn't yeah. happen. No, it did not. It did not and, happen. And so to follow it up with you, um, cause this was the episode where we, we had Ryan hammer on. Um, so we were trying kind of just trying to like, like the season had yet to kick off. Yep. Um, so I had Michigan state over 22 and a half wins as a mortal lock. Um, you know, and obviously, I don't think postseason counts. I think conference tournament does. So they would have had to go like twenty three and eight or something like that in the regular season. Uh, which, looking back at it, that's never really a lock, right? Like they yep. would, they would have had, but they were preseason ranked top five. If yeah, they I were number four days, preseason. They were number four. If I waited a couple days and saw them lose at home to JMU, I probably would have changed my yeah. mind. But that was my mortal lock as far as like an over under um which was bad you know and and nobody's perfect cody but yeah what's your what was your best take my best which which is honestly this is sad but it is my best i said preseason that purdue was going to make it to the final four i said they were going to get their monkey off the back this was the year zach Eady, like i i was, was really confident that a lot of these boys being from the state of indiana were going to make it to the final four i really truly believed that and then in my bracket, I pick Creighton. So yeah, I'm an idiot. Um, I should have just followed November me and things would have been all right and well. And then I wouldn't have had to give away the gift card. I could have kept it for myself. But yeah, um, I, I did say that Purdue was going to make it to the Final Four. Felt great about it. They did. Um, I bet Purdue to win the Big Ten at plus 200. I bet a lot of money on that. And that cashed um, with with relative ease. I was a little nervous after that loss to Northwestern, though. Early in conference play, I was like, "Oh shit!" Like, uh, well, because Wisconsin was uh, was in first place, yeah. after like seven games. Yep, and Illinois was playing well, but yeah, it was never in doubt, really. Yep. And that's, I mean, that's a great take from an Indiana guy. Yep. Um, hey, Hoosiers, we you know, know Paul. It. We us and, Indiana. And I'm not going to use boys. this as my as my best take, but I did, you know, being a Clemson guy, like you call Purdue. I, I was all over Clemson having mm -hmm. a legacy season this year. They made it to the Elite Eight. That's a humble flex, but I I, I did not have, like, full belief in that really ever. Um, like, I was just a complete wreck of, like, anxiety watching Clemson basketball. And the whole time I'm like, you know, I know we're a good team, but could we, like, just slip and lose a bunch of games and mm -hmm. miss the tournament? Absolutely. So they ended up making the Elite Eight as a sixth seed. It was a fantastic season. It's a program changing season. Yeah. But it's not like I was like, I guarantee this is going to happen. So the other things, I guess, um, you know, I, I had Houston, dom like not dominating the big 12, but winning the big 12 um, yep. and, and having a seamless transition. That was correct about that. Now I did in my first bracket that I made, I had Houston winning it all. I can't judge myself on that. Um, at all 
Um, you know, obviously I went 95 and 65 in our pick them. Beat yep. you out by six. We both did pretty yep. well. Um, yeah. Uh, dude, 30, the fact that you were above 500. That's that's yeah. crazy. You were you were positive thirty wins in a game where we picked a hundred and a year we picked a hundred and sixty games, a hundred and sixty yeah. games, and you got ninety five of them right. That's legitimately insane. Uh, no, Props these to are, you. These are ba- basically we had baseball records right here. Yeah, and if a baseball team goes ninety five and sixty five, they won their division almost all yeah. the time. So it's a fantastic season for me as far as picks go because again we weren't throwing up like Kentucky versus. Uh, Vanderbilt like we weren't yeah. picking games like that that were obvious it was only tough ones um, so proud about that but I guess the one that I'll say here is that on my first bracketology um, when I I didn't look at like resumes I kind of just projected outwards to what I thought mm-hmm. was going to happen I had Purdue UConn Houston Arizona as my one seeds um, again this was in November we hadn't seen enough from any of these teams to think that that was like a mortal lock. It seemed like a mortal lock while the season progressed, but you know, mid November when Arizona actually had a case for that last number one as well. um, I feel pretty darn good about, about that. Just as far as just like, this is what I think is going to happen. I'm not looking at resumes because there weren't resumes. I'm just like, this is what I think is going to happen. And it pretty much did. So that's probably my best take, but. Yep. Absolute, absolute wins across the board. So, um, a hell of a college basketball season. It has been so much fun to talk about. Um, thank you guys for listening along. Um, I've gotten a question, Nick. I didn't know if you have gotten this question at all, uh, but it has been, what what content are you going to make after college basketball is over? And the, the answer to that is, I'm not sure yet. Um, so for for y'all listening the the podcast is going to take next week off as a reward a little treat to Nick and I on a, a hard fought season we did the vacation episode we picked and all we these had no games breaks. no we had breaks no breaks football and basketball right? we we legitimately put out a podcast every single week except for the lost episode which we recorded we recorded the a podcast we lost. recorded a podcast every week we record. We did. we did not publish a podcast every week, but we recorded a podcast every week, um, starting in, in early, July, literally so July. Yes. So nine months. How many weeks is that? It's like thirty-seven weeks. Yeah. Mathematically, that's I, that's something we like deserve that. a little sabbatical here. Yep. Um, so that being said, Nick and I will. We're going to take a week off. We're going to find out how we're going to do the summer and spring ball and the NFL draft and all all of that stuff um we're gonna try to find some more people because that ryan hammer episode was outstanding we're gonna try to find some more brilliant people to come on the show and and do interviews and stuff with us so um super super excited for that so there will be no podcast next week however the following weeks um maybe every other week we'll see how it goes and and cody there's a lot to talk about because you know we haven't been touching on college football Yep. Um, but there's there's been happenings. Yep. Um, Clemson filed a lawsuit against yep. the ACC. They won out. The college football playoff now is trying to get to 14 teams, and now they're paying the Big Ten and the SEC all their revenue. So all these teams yep. that aren't in the SEC and Big Ten are like, well, if we don't join those conferences, we're going to get left behind unless we get a new grant of rights. So there's a lot to talk about in that sense. The transfer portal is going to be crazy in college basketball, so that's not dying yet. We're not yep. going away. If you're tired of college basketball, I'm sorry because it's still it's yep. still hot right now. We sleep in May, okay? Yep. Not April. We sleep in May. Um, and the NFL draft is continue. just a, is at exactly. the end of this month. We're, we're going to talk NFL draft. We'll probably touch on the NBA draft a little bit. Yep. Right. I'm assuming we'll definitely cover the week before. Yep. Um, you know, is there enough for us to be ripping out hour long episodes week in, week out throughout the summer? Probably not. We could maybe make it work, but it's unnecessary. We can cover as much as there is to be covered from April, May, June. And then once July comes around, which will be sooner than you realize, you know, we got to start. Guess what? We're back to conference (laughs) predictions. So it's uh, it's a cycle. Yep. So, uh, very, very excited for that. We have a lot of projects and stuff that we're working on. We will are all 
you know, you guys are likely following us on social, so you're not going to miss anything there either. But thank you guys for all the support. We really, really appreciate it, especially if you made it to this point in the podcast. Um, it's been a hell of a year and we will see you in two weeks in two weeks. Yep. Absolutely. Can't wait for it. Peace. Peace out.